Good afternoon, everyone. This is The Whispering Gentleman. So flick off the lights, sit down in your comfortable chair, and grab a glass of your favorite drink as we dive on in. I stumbled upon a gas station on an empty highway several years ago. That night at the gas station still haunts me today. By not necessarily. I had been driving on the empty highway for a couple hours in my car. Just as I was about to fall asleep, the car let out a ding to let me know that the fuel was running low. I was tired. Very tired. It had definitely not been a good idea to decide to take a drive home at night instead of booking a room in a motel. I looked at the never-ending road and the thick forest lining along it. The headlights illuminated what was otherwise the darkest night I'd ever seen. Not a single star dotted the dark cloud-dominated sky. There was no one on the road, and the monotony of the same forest mile after mile was starting to take a toll on me. I watched as the forest blurred beside me after I steadily pressed my foot on the accelerator. There must have been a gas station somewhere around here. I spotted one, right between the lines of trees that populated either side of the road. It stuck out like a sore thumb amongst the dark trees. Dim lights did a poor job of illuminating the station and gave it a run-down, neglected feel. I ignored all red flags as I pulled up to the station and parked my car in one of the bays to refuel it. The dim white lights overhead seemed to give me a slight migraine. They were intensely white, but very dim. I saw no other cars in the bay. The gas pump was old and slightly damaged, but it did the job and filled my tank. After filling my car, I started to walk towards the convenience store to pay. The heavy glass doors were unlocked and the lights inside were on. I pushed open the door and walked inside. The place felt like it hadn't been updated since the 80s. A retro tiled floor combined the products that I either hadn't heard of or were from old brands led me to this conclusion. The shopkeeper caught me staring at the aisles of old products that had been discontinued a long time ago and spoke. Is there anything wrong, sir? He asked, making me jump. I had somehow only noticed his presence now, and even he represented the 80s, having dressed in a striped button-up shirt and slacks. He sported an impressive mustache, thin spectacles, and had an air of mystery around him. Uh, no. Just came here to pay for the gas and, uh, buy a coffee? I said, still collecting myself. I walked over to the counter while filling my pockets to search for my wallet. I must have left it back at the car. I'll be right back. I forgot my wallet. I told the shopkeeper. He flashed me a knowing smile. There was something wrong with his teeth, but I didn't register it as I quickly whipped around to go to my car. They were riding. As I stepped out of the convenience store and began my walk towards my car, when I noticed I wasn't getting any closer to my car, it didn't make sense. There was a short distance between my car and the shop, yet no matter how much I walked, I covered no distance. It was like the ground had turned into a treadmill, and no matter how far I walked, I never got closer to my car. I looked behind me and realized I was still a step or two from the entrance of the convenience store. I saw the shopkeeper staring at me through the glass doors with an indescribable expression. His face was neutral, yet the way his eyes focused on me fueled a strong sense of apprehension within my soul. I ran, now more frantic than before. Paying for the fuel was no longer a priority. I wanted to get to my car and book it. It was all futile. No matter how fast I ran, I never made it to my car. The nightmare didn't stop. How long do you think you would have kept running in my situation? I was defeated and knew I could not fight whatever force was acting upon this place. I had made a mistake of ever stopping by and now I was paying for it. 
the very laws of physics were being bent in this place, and I still could not understand how walking forward never seemed to help me actually physically move forward. Panic surged through my veins as my desire to free myself from this loop grew into an animalistic urge for survival. Nothing worked. I could only have run for so long before I collapsed, unable to run any further. When faced with this defeat, I had no choice but to walk back inside the convenience store and face the shopkeeper who had continually stared at me throughout the struggle. As I turned around, I seemed to snap out of that cycle and my steps actually allowed me to move forward. I burst through the glass doors and screamed at the shopkeeper. What is happening? He smiled. A wide smile that stretched from ear to ear. There was something wrong with his mustache. I squinted and noticed that it was pulsating and worthing with maggots. There were dozens of them wriggling around in his bushy mustache and climbing into his nostrils. My scream echoed several times in the small convenience store and was followed by the shopkeeper's hysterical laugh. I tried to run out of the glass doors again and slam into my body against them to open them. They didn't budge. The blow knocked the wind out of my body causing my lungs to feel like deflated balloons. A dull, excruciating pain spread across my entire torso. My vision swam and I lay there on the floor struggling to recover. I don't know how long I lay there as the waves of pain flowing through my torso began to fade away. But when I found the strength to get back up off the floor and look around, the shopkeeper was gone. The place looked near, like it had been constructed a couple months ago. The cobwebs that once stretched over the shelves were now gone, and the tiled floor was whiter. The fluorescent lights above also seemed to shine brighter. A deep, primal instinct to escape resided in my gut, but the glass doors wouldn't open no matter how hard I pushed against them like they were held in place by a physical barrier. I stared through the glass at my car, and I suddenly wanted to be out of there in the cool night air instead of being trapped inside this gas station. It felt as if the outside resided in a different dimension, and the interdimensional barrier between the glass and the outside kept me from going back outside. It was a viable theory, considering how old this place seemed when I walked in only to have it suddenly renewed as if Time itself had ticked back. A low moan reverberated through the air, catching my attention immediately. My thoughts about my current dilemma completely flew out of my head as the sound caused every single one of my senses to stand on end. I slowly looked behind me and noticed a corpse behind me. The body was burnt. The skin was charred and black in some places and red and raw in the others. The face of the corpse was Completely disfigured, her left eye was missing. Part of her seemed to have melted onto the floor due to the extreme heat. I jumped back and had a strong urge to empty my stomach onto the floor. Bile rose to the back of my throat, but I swallowed it back down. I slowly walked away from the corpse and turned around into the aisle to avoid it. I could not bear looking at the body without feeling the pain the person must have felt as they were burnt alive. Much to my dismay, I nearly stepped on another burnt corpse in the next aisle. It was similar to the last one and finally gave my stomach the push it needed to empty all of its contents onto the floor. A significant portion of my vomit landed on the burnt corpse itself and seeped into the burnt and separated tissues. I started to gag even more violently at the sight of the scene, but my stomach had nothing else to expel. Walking into another aisle led me to the third and final corpse in this place. Those poor people seem to have all been burnt in this place. There is no evidence of a fire ever occurring in the convenience store. As I walked around it though, and I obviously would have always burnt to my demise had there been a fire a short while ago, these bodies seem to have peered within the disappearance of the shopkeeper. I heard movement behind me. This was followed by the sound of something being dragged against the floor. It almost had a squeak to it as if a wet, heavy sponge was being pushed over the tiles. I stood completely frozen in fear. Suddenly, something grabbed at my leg. More shuffling sounds followed from my left. Another thing grabbed my leg. It felt like a hand. Its grip was weak and faltering. 
My heart skipped a beat as the third had joined them and gripped at my leg. I was frozen in fear, and my heart was violently bashing against my chest. It felt like I was having a heart attack. Help us! Three mangled voices moaned. Then, they used their hands to slowly climb up my legs and stand up using me as support. I still couldn't see what was grabbing at me as they were behind me. A mixture of dry, burnt flesh and a wet, pus-filled wounds rubbed against my bare hand as one of them reached up and grabbed at my hand. I slowly turned my head to look down at what was grabbing me and came face to face with the lifeless eyes of the burnt corpse. All three of them were focused on standing up by slowly crawling up my body. This somehow snapped me out of my paralysis. I shook them off me like a scorpion had gotten into my pants and lunged forward, nearly falling on the floor myself. It was then that I realized that a fire had started to spread throughout the place. The black smoke reduced my visibility and made it incredibly hard to see. The corpses continued to crawl towards me, inch by inch, as the fire began to consume every inch of the store. Unbearable heat radiated onto my skin and deep into my body as I began to slowly burn in this hell. I ran aimlessly through the store as the fire licked at me and extended its tendrils to consume me. It felt as if layers of my skin were starting to melt off. I bumped against a solid surface and felt a burning metal handle on my stomach. In desperation, I burnt my hand to turn that handle and opened the door. I found myself in a toilet. The fire had not spread through here, but smoke was licking in through the sides of the door. I may not die in the fire, but I would soon succumb to suffocation. What was happening to me? I struggled to come up with an explanation in my mind for the predicament I found myself in. I had walked into a gas station to pay for my fuel, and now suddenly... This place was on fire. Where did the shopkeeper go to? And why were the maggots in his face? Where had the corpses appeared from? The rising temperature of the enclosed room snapped me out of my thoughts and urged me to take action. I spotted a medium-sized window right above the toilet that I could break and use to get out of the store. I smashed the glass with my fist and punched it several more times to clear the window. Shards of glass were embedded into my knuckles, but my primal need for survival kept me going. The window was just barely big enough for me to crawl through. My head went through easily. It felt like crawling through a shark's teeth. Glass stabbed into me and formed along with slices as I pushed myself out through the window. I hadn't removed all the glass from the window, and the sharp bits remaining on the edges dug into me and drew linear cuts on my whole body. My entire torso was burning in pain, and as I continued to push myself through the window with all my strength, I started to wonder whether dying in the fire would have been less painful. I managed to get myself through, though, except I hadn't accounted for one thing. Since I dove headfirst out of the window, there was no way for me to land on my feet. I could swear I heard my skull crack open as my head slammed against the asphalt. As I heard the dull thud of my body hitting the floor after, my vision started to tunnel. In one single moment, I felt the pain across my entire raw, burnt, and cut body. In the next moment, that pain seemed to lift me off as my consciousness faded away like a candle being blown. Several days later, I found myself waking up in a hospital surrounded by the beeps of machinery. I was covered from head to toe in casts, and my entire body hurt. The doctors told me I was found outside of an old abandoned gas station. They speculated my body had been dumped by a supposed kidnapper who had tortured me to death and tried to burn my body as well. They told me I had brain damage and severe memory loss when I tried to tell them the true story. I was a traumatized maniac to them. I managed to recover in the hospital as months and years passed. After I successfully went through rehabilitation, only my physical and mental scars remained. Today, I drove to that same gas station. The window that I had crawled out of that horrific night several years ago was still broken. I didn't stop there, and instead, continued driving. As I passed the gas station, 
I saw that same shopkeeper I had met the night staring at me through the glass pebble doors with a malicious smile spread across his face. If you like this story, be sure to check out more stories by Not Necessarily linked in the description below. As always, sleep tight and stay terrified. I rented a beautiful home in the foothills of West Virginia. I needed some time away from the hustle and bustle. And this place was amazing. It was like someone had plopped a beach house down in the middle of the woods. I didn't need a place this big for myself, but I couldn't pass up the amazing price for a weekly rental. When I asked the woman why this beautiful home was so cheap, she smiled nervously and said, it's just that time of the year. I didn't question her any further for fear that she would realize her mistake and up the price. The day I arrived was mostly sunny with a few clouds lazily drifting by, just enough to give some ambience to the scenery. It was on a wildlife preserve, so animals lingered in the field without a care in the world. I saw a deer and a turkey walk right up to my car as I drove down the dirt road towards my destination. When I pulled in, I thought I had arrived in heaven. There was a lake right next to the house with fields and woods all around. A fire pit was set up beside the lake with a ring of wooden chairs encircling it. As I parked my car, I got my suitcase. A deer walked right up to me and sniffed me. I held up my hand and she assumed it was because she had no antlers. Regarded me for a moment before sticking her nose in my palm and taking a deep breath. She eyed me once more then slowly walked off as if she had said hello to a neighbor and was on her way. I typed in the security code and went inside. The pictures didn't do this house justice. My jaw dropped and dra I dragged it around looking at all the rooms. There was a full game room with a pool table, a card table, foosball, air hockey, a giant TV, you name it. This place had a hot tub and a half dozen decks surrounding it. You could step out and see in any direction from a bird's eye view. There were rocking chairs all around, which I fully intended to take advantage of. The entire place was set up for comfort and ease. I put my suitcase in the master bedroom then, brought the rest of my supplies in, which consisted of a lot of food. I had no idea how far the stores were from the house, and I didn't want to waste hours of my day looking for a grocery store when I could be relaxing. Once I had put all my food away, I looked around for the Wi-Fi password. It was posted on a bulletin board in the kitchen, along with some other instructions. This is our home. Please take care of it as you would your own. The dishes and silverware are here for your use. Please make sure they don't accidentally visit your house. I chuckled at these little reminders. Please don't flush anything but toilet paper. But then I paused as I read an unusual one. When you retire for the evening, make sure you close and lock all windows, doors, blinds, and curtains. Don't open them or go out onto the deck for any reason until sunup. If you wish to stargaze, do so only on Wednesday night. This struck me as rather odd. I had no intention of doing any of this, of course. Once I go to bed, I'm out till morning. I settled in and made myself some supper. I took it outside and sat on a rocking chair that overlooked the lake. I watched the sunset marrying itself in the water before disappearing. Shortly after the clouds lit up a brilliant red at twilight. I never wanted to leave this place. Once the post-dust insects came in, I decided to adjourn back inside and read a book. I perused their selection, which ranged all over, from the standard paperbacks of John Grisham and Lee Chow to cookbooks to history books. There were also a few more esoteric choices, such as Strange Creatures of the Wilderness and Haunted West Virginia. I decided on a Clive Cussler book and took it with me to bed. 
A few chapters in, I felt sleep tugging at my eyelids, so I laid the book aside and snuggled in. It seemed like ten seconds later, the morning sun was peeking in through a sliver of the blinds, telling me that it was time to get up. I made some coffee and a bagel, then went back out to greet my lake. It had been raining, and that fresh smell lingered in the air. The feeling of renewal surrounded me. I wanted to stay here for the rest of my life. I milled around the house that day, taking some incredible wildlife pictures. I read some more of my book and pretty much enjoyed relaxing. When I went to bed that evening, I made sure the doors were locked and the blinds were closed as instructed. The next day went pretty much the same. I decided to do some stargazing that evening, but it was overcast and the stars only peeked out here and there. I went to bed disappointed for the first time this week. The following night, I went to bed early with the intention of getting up in the middle of the night and looking for the missing stars from the night before. At midnight, the alarm on my phone woke me up. I peeked out through the curtain and saw a sky full of stars with an area of cloud in sight. Excited, I grabbed my camera and tripod, then headed out onto the deck. The air was crisp, but not cold. I got my camera set up on the tripod and started taking pictures of the stars. As the camera did its thing, my eyes drifted toward the lake. It was a moonless night, and there was little light, but as my eyes adjusted, I swore I saw someone sitting in one of the chairs near the lake. As I looked more intently, I saw more than one somebody. It appeared that each chair was occupied. I wondered if some local kids were borrowing my fire ring for a party, not realizing that I had rented the place for the week. My eye rose and I began to mentally compose the email I would send to the owner informing her of the intrusion when my mind froze. None of them were wearing clothes. I know when I see a naked person. Admittedly, that hasn't been nearly as often as I'd like lately, but I know the look. These people didn't look like that. They were tall, dark, and looked like every one of them needed a full body shave. And then it hit me. They weren't human. My curiosity and fear raged a mighty battle, but in the end, curiosity won. I slowly adjusted my camera from aiming at the sky to aiming at the chair surrounding the fire pit. I had just snapped the first picture when one of the creatures noticed me. It growled something to the rest of them, and they all turned and stared at me. I've never felt such a shard of pure terror penetrate my mind as I did that moment. I grabbed my camera and darted back inside. And once there, I made sure to lock the door. It wasn't ten seconds until the assault began. The pounding on the doors and windows was nothing in comparison to the guttural growling and screaming. I was terrified beyond rational thought. I ran downstairs searching desperately for some place to hide. The pounding seemed to follow me as they had surrounded the house. I searched for a room to hide in that didn't have windows. In desperation, I threw myself into a closet and locked the door. There was no light, so I shined my phone around in the cramped closet and set on a box of cleaning chemicals. My breathing came in ragged gasps as panic and physical exertion conspired to send me into unconsciousness. The pounding seemed farther away. I was able to calm myself enough to slow my breathing. I looked at the camera, still mounted to the tripod. I turned on the camera and looked at the picture. Yeah, it was blurry. My settings were still for taking pictures of stars. Any movement would blur the image. Yeah, so much for proof. The pounding had ceased. I listened with hopeful ears to see if my siege of terror was over. That's when I heard the terrible sound. It wasn't a scream or pounding or anything like that. It was a creak of a floorboard. I stopped breathing and listened. 
and it must have been my imagination. And then I heard the heavy breathing. I crept up to the door and listened. It was right outside the door. I started shaking. After ten minutes, this creature hadn't ripped the door open and devoured me. I sat back down and tried to relax. If I was going to die, then I was. There was nothing I could do about the creature right outside my door that was obviously hunting me. I relaxed and slowed down my breathing. My adrenaline finally wore off and I crashed. I leaned my head against the shelf and waited for my inevitable death. I woke up sometime later. I slowly sat up and stretched my neck to work out the kinks. I looked at my phone that said 3.33 a.m. It also said low battery. I had run out of options. I stuck my phone in my pocket. I picked up my camera with the tripod still attached and reached for the door. I turned the knob quietly as possible and inched open the door. I stifled a gasp when I saw what looked like a giant bear rug curled up in a ball on the floor. Its breathing was loud and steady. I pushed the door open as far as I could and tried to squeeze through. The door refused to open enough for me to fit. I looked down and saw the door was pressed against the creature's foot. There was nothing for it. I had to move the foot or stay in my closet prison. I pushed with all my might. The door opened another inch. I braced my back against the door frame and pushed again. The foot moved enough for me to escape. Then the creature stirred in its sleep. I froze halfway out the door. The creature began to move. It stirred and began moving its gargantuan arms, then its legs. Suddenly it kicked the door, throwing me back into the closet and slamming the door. I landed on my back and the wind was knocked out of me. I lay there, trying to regain my breath and assess the damage. I felt pain, but didn't think anything was broken. I slowly rose and approached the door. I opened it and peeked out. The creature was still laying there, breathing slowly, apparently asleep. Its foot had moved and the door was able to open. I stepped through, pointing my tripod at the creature as though it were some magical sword that would help me if it woke up. I sidestepped through the door, keeping my eyes on the mountain of fur laying in front of me and back toward the front door. I glanced behind me just in time to see a second creature, wide awake, towering over me. It looked down, and a low growl escaped it. I made a smelly puddle on the floor. It sniffed and recoiled. I jumped at the chance and dove for the door. It was locked. I grabbed the latch and turned it every way until it opened. Once I was through the door, the creature regained its senses. In three strides, it was out the door reaching for me. I slid across the hood doing my best Dukes of Hazard impersonation, landed, and dove inside the car. The camera and tripod jammed the door open. I started the car and threw it in reverse before the door was closed. I turned, causing my door to swing open impacting the creature and sending it sprawling to the ground. I put it in drive and stomped the gas pedal. The car slid sideways until I eased off the gas. As I sped down the dirt road, I glanced in my rearview mirror. I could see the red of my taillights illuminating two of the creatures chasing me. I tried to go faster, but as soon as I stepped on the gas, a turn in the road slowed me down. I slid through several turns as fast as I could while staying on the road. Trees can kill me just as effectively as those things. The dirt road emptied onto an asphalt road. I drove as fast as possible for an hour before I looked back again. The mirror showed only disappearing yellow lines. I slowed a little to the speed limit, and I didn't stop until I was home. I sat in my driveway, waiting for the creatures to catch up to me and rip me to pieces. After 20 minutes, that didn't happen. I got out of the car and went inside my house. I made sure the doors and windows were all locked. My clock said it was 6.17 in the morning. I took a shower and changed. I was extremely tired. I laid down in the bed and stared at the ceiling, replaying the last six hours. My mind 
tried to tell me I had dreamed the whole thing, but I looked at the blurry photo on the camera and wasn't so sure. After trying and failing to sleep for a few hours, I decided to call the woman whose house I had just abandoned. Hello? She said on the third ring, Hi, uh, this is Tom. I was renting the house this week. Was? Yes. I had a little problem and had to leave. Oh? Was, was it anything serious? Uh, you could say that. I had to leave for health reasons. I see. Will you be going back? No. I said a bit more forcefully than intended. She was silent for a long moment. Did anything strange happen? The whole ordeal invaded my mind in a vicious flashback. I knew it wouldn't be like the last time. I was scarred for life. I would never look at the outdoors the same way again. No. I lied. Nothing at all. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Whispering Gentleman. So, flick off the lights, sit down in your comfortable chair, and grab a glass of your favorite drink as we dive on into it. You know that feeling you get when you realize that you're a fucking loser? No? Well, I sure do. Happens most nights after I leave the casino creeps up on me during my walk over to the bar like a rage that wants to crawl up in the pit of my stomach and destroy something. So I do my best to keep it stuffed down. Alcohol seems to work best. That's not my problem though. It's just a byproduct. Gambling? Ah, now that's another story. That's my weakness. Or sickness. Depends on who you ask. I asked my ex-wife's opinion on the matter once. She said something like, if you don't quit drinking, fucking leaving, Brian. I mean it. Lovely gal. She had a pen chant for slamming doors and giving me shit. Wasn't much for philosophical debates, though. Ever since she tested the integrity of my door's hinges for the final time, I'd been on a particular bad bender, a losing streak like no other. So, there I was, idly sipping vodka and peering out the pub's grimy window, taking in the empty street watching the raindrops collect against the glass when my luck finally changed. The approaching headlights shone in at me, blinding me momentarily. I squinted out a sleek black luxury sedan, probably a Cadillac or something even nicer. I don't even know. I've never been a car guy, but it was impressive nonetheless. Its owner exited swiftly, wearing an expensive looking suit that was absolutely drenched in flashy dress shoes. What was this guy doing here? He stuck out like a sore thumb among the crowd of sad sacks and outcasts inhabiting this dingy pub. He pushed through the door, stopping to shake the water off from his shoulders and slick back his sopping hair from his eyes before surveying the bar. For all the fancy clothes he had on, his face wore the features of a haunted man. He chose a spot at the bar, a few seats down from me, ignoring my lingering eyes. I heard him mutter, Something to the bartender who I never stayed sober long enough to remember the name of and place a hundred dollar bill on the counter. If he knew any better, he wouldn't be flashing money around like that in this neighborhood, I thought, torn between jealousy and concern for him. The bartender poured him a shot and set the bottle down in front of him. I noticed his hands were shaking as he threw back his first shot and hastily prepared for the next. He took his next three in short order sighing loudly after his last he glanced over at me with the same haunted expression he grunted took out another hundred and tossed it at the bartender grabbing the bottle and making his way back into the night i'll admit i'm an opportunist here was a stranger who clearly in the midst of some crisis throwing money around like it was nothing and the gears began to turn in my cloudy head perhaps i could use this to my advantage i sprinted out after him letting my stool fall to the floor in my haste. 
He was nearly to his car when I caught up with him. Hey, excuse me. Can you spare some cash, mate? He froze his back to me. I expected him to ignore me. Maybe tell me to piss off, but I didn't expect the fury in his eyes when he finally turned around. His lips curled into a snarl. His hands clenched into fists. I mumbled some sort of apology before I started to slink away. Surprised when he reached forward and put his hand on my shoulder, pulling me towards him aggressively. His crazed eyes bore into mine while his mouth quivered like he was struggling to keep words of what he wanted to say inside. Gradually, his grip relaxed. Yes. Yes. Here. Take this. Please, take this from me. He said, presenting a wallet that was bursting at the seams. Take it now, he commanded after I hesitated. Still uncertain, I reached for it. As soon as it was in my hand, he turned away. I opened the wallet, thumbing through the bills. There was nearly a thousand dollars inside. No credit cards, no IDs, just cash. It will only cause you pain, he shouted before slamming his door shut, leaving me stunned in the pouring rain. Now, a wallet full of money is a hell of a thing to squander. But squander I did. It only took a couple of days and a few unwise bets for me to have nearly exhausted my funds. I should have used it to pay off some debts, but I had a feeling, a really good feeling about betting with this stranger's money. I figured the universe had given me a gift, so maybe I could capitalize on it. I don't know why I was surprised, but I don't know why I felt so betrayed. I had a chance to. I'd been up for a while, but I got greedy and I couldn't stop myself. Following an all too familiar trajectory of self-loathing, I found myself back in the same shitty pub, sipping vodka once more, intent on pissing the remaining $50 away. I tossed the bills at the bartender who I never stayed sober long enough to remember the name of. He scoffed at me. Nice fucking tip. In my drunken haze, I saw red, and I slammed the glass into the counter, but the obscenities I planned for him quickly turned to ones of pain as the glass shattered and dug deep into my palm. All right, psycho. Get the hell out of here. Don't bother coming back, he shouted, pointing me to the door. I didn't need to be told twice. Fuck, I winced trying to pull the pieces of glass from my hand on my walk home. They were really in there. After a while, I gave up, wrapping my jacket around the wound and doing my best to ignore the dull throbbing. I decided I would deal with it the next day. Once I got inside, I simply crawled into bed, watching the ceiling spin and cursing myself for leading such a miserable existence. The next morning, or really it was the afternoon by the time I awoke, wasn't very forgiving of the night before. I felt nauseous, and my hand was burning. It took me a little while to remember why it was wrapped up in my coat. I turned over, mentally preparing myself to climb out of bed when my eyes fell on my nightstand, or rather, what was on top of it. The wallet. It was stuffed. Overflowing, in fact. Disregarding my injured hand, I feverishly thumbed through it, elated to find that there were $5,000 inside. I tossed the bills on my bed, laughing in disbelief. But how did they get there? How could it be? I could have almost believed that the night before had been a dream, but my raging hangover and the glass shards in my palm were proof to the contrary. It just didn't make any sense. I sat there for a long while, staring down at the black leather that was now speckled with my dried blood, and I unwrapped my hand and looked down at the wound, glancing back and forth between it and the wallet. I found myself recalling what the man who surrendered the mysterious wallet had said. It will only cause you pain. Once I understood, there was no turning back. I tried not to think about it as I swung the hammer into my fingers. The sound of bone crunching was sickening, and the pain exploded through my mangled digits. Ah! Damn. Fuck. I screamed, my eyes watering. 
I gritted my teeth and checked the wallet again. Incredibly, there were more bills. But as I counted them, I realized it was a decidedly smaller sum. $400. What the hell? That hurt worse than the glass, I yelled at the wallet. Fortunately, he didn't reply. All right, let's try that again. Close my eyes, bite my shirt. Another swing, another crunch. Stars of pain in my eyes. Obscenities. A hundred and fifty more dollars. What? You don't like that? That's not enough for you? I growled, examining my mangled, swollen, bloody, glass-filled hand. I paced the room, seething. Okay, you want some pain? I'll give you some fucking pain. I took a pair of pliers with me to the bathroom, propping the wallet up against the wall so it could watch. I don't know. It feels foolish in the hindsight, but I wanted to make sure I could see. I picked him over. You know, something that wouldn't be so visible. I clamped the pliers around it and braced myself. I vigorously began wiggling against the tooth, building pressure until I could feel it start to move. Blood leaked from my gums and mixed with my saliva, making it nearly impossible to keep my grip on the tooth. The pliers slipped off more than a few times. I was getting more and more frustrated by the second. I needed both hands to pull it out. I forced my injured hand to my face, using it to support the other. I squeezed the pliers around my tooth as hard as I could and loosened it from my gum. More and more blood poured out as I pulled. Almost there. Almost there. Almost. I could feel that the root was on the verge of tearing away. I clamped down even harder to keep from slipping off at the last second. Instead, my tight grip ended up crushing my motor into pieces before I was able to get it all the way out. The howl I let out was deafening and gripped the sink to keep myself from fainting. I swayed back and forth, swallowing the thick, irony mixture that filled my mouth. Oh, better be worth it. I grimaced, picking up the wallet. I threw it to the ground when I saw a meager payout within. What do you want? What more can I do? I demanded. I dragged my razor across my cheeks. I punched my mirror. I bashed my face into the sink. With each effort, the wallet awarded me with less and less, until I was finally given nothing for my efforts. I screamed down at it, half in anger, half in pain. The room tilted viciously, and I slumped down beside it, out of breath and furious. You... you won't... more? I gasped, a realization hitting me. You want more than my pain. You, you need more than just mine. I thought back to the man again, his car, his clothes, that haunted look on his face. What had he done to have so much? How many people had he harmed? How far had he been willing to go? How far will I?